Right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so firstly, my apologies that I can't give this paper in person. Uh, unfortunately, the symposium schedule and my teaching schedule haven't interacted very well. Um, I can promise that I'd much rather be attending the symposium right now uh, than teaching third year architecture students about Orientalism. Um, but here we are. Um, so I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me to talk uh, and also for all of the work they've put into organising the symposium. Um, most of this paper is based on work that I did for my PhD, uh, which was rather a long time ago now. Um, but it's been fun and pretty useful actually to revisit this work um, and it's given me a few ideas actually about um, how I could and should um, take this forward in the future. Um, I've got a great deal of affection for the site of Ur, uh, partly because it was so useful during my PhD as a source of data, uh, but also because um, during the four seasons that I, I excavated at nearby Tel Kaiba, um, the team was based at Ur, so um, I spent many months at the site um, and had some great times there and met some uh, brilliant people. Um, anyway, on with the paper. Uh, so, before I can discuss the domestic housing at Ur, uh, I need you to convince you all of a specific point, um, and that's that domestic housing in this period and in this region had no windows. Um, and some of you may already be convinced of this, in which case uh, feel free to go and make a cup of tea for the next 10 minutes, um, but uh, others might require a bit more evidence for um, total absence of windows. Um, so it does seem generally accepted that Bronze Age Mesopotamian houses had very few windows, um, but every time there's trouble with a building plan and no obvious way to light a space, researchers still often attempted to hypothesize light openings at a high level. Um, and I'm here to argue that uh, that is not necessary. So um, first let's look at the evidence for windows. Um, so this comes in three main forms. Um, there is actually one known excavated uh, archeologically recovered window from Bronze Age Mesopotamia, um, which is this window on the right hand image. Um, so this was found in a house in early dynastic uh, um, Tel Asmar. Uh, so it's this very small um, window, but uh, the major problem with it is proof that windows were used for lighting in this architecture is that this window is between two internal rooms. Um, so, so much for that. Um, a second source of evidence uh, comes from um, the discovery of clay uh, window grills. Um, so window grills are still used in traditional architecture in many uh, hot arid regions. Um, so they're certainly a workable and plausible element for regional architecture. Um, the trouble with window grills as evidence um, for the widespread use of uh, windows in architecture is that they're incredibly rare. Um, very, very few fragments have ever been recovered from all of the excavations of um, southern Mesopotamia which considering they're pretty robust and distinctive um, objects, strongly suggest that they were extremely uncommon in architecture. Um, the use of these objects as window grills is also somewhat debatable. They could have other uses as well. Um, so again, this is fairly weak evidence for possible windows. Um, the third possible source of evidence is house models. So a handful of recovered uh, clay house models mostly have openings which do resemble windows. Um, so assuming their model are actual contemporary houses, uh, this seems like quite good evidence that there were windows in architecture. Um, however, again, there are plenty of problems with house models as a source of evidence for windows. Um, firstly, I, again, there are very, very few of them, um, so you don't have much of a sample. Um, secondly, uh, None of them come from southern Mesopotamia. Uh, so these two examples that I've put here, one's from Nuzi, one's from Asa. Um, thirdly, they don't really resemble excavated house plans at all. Uh, they seem actually more likely to be modeled on some other structure, maybe on shrines or small temples. Um, so whether they reflect houses at all is, uh, is quite um, uncertain. And lastly, uh, these house models had a utilitarian function. Um, which seems to have required their sides to be pierced with openings, um, whether or not the buildings that they might be modelled on um, actually had openings or not. 
Um, so they're usually interpreted as incense burners or similar um, kind of objects. So um, when we examine these possible indicators for windows in Bronze Age Mesopotamia, um, it doesn't really stand up all that well. Um, all of them are quite weak. Um, however, a lack of evidence isn't proof. Um, so instead, I'm going to try to build a positive case here for um, there being an, an, a genuine absence of windows in this architecture. Um, first, we can uh, look at some supporting evidence similar to what we looked at for um, the case for windows. Um, there is one house model, in fact, which uh, is this one here at the top right, um, which is, was found at Mari. Um, and this actually resembles an excavated Mesopotamian house plan. And it doesn't look too much like a house, mostly because it's round, um, for reasons which are probably connected to its practical function. Uh, but internally, it has a number of separated chambers, uh, which were arranged around a central space that looks a lot like a, a courtyard, which is even square. Um, and Paolo Prusasco, who uh, worked on access analysis um, of old Babylonian housing at Ur, um, he considered this model to accurately represent a house um, similar to the ones that uh, he was working on that, and that I'll be discussing today. Um, significantly, unlike other house models, this one does not have any windows. Um, secondly, we have some represent representations of domestic houses. Um, although these are rare and they're generally from significantly later periods. Um, so my example here on the um, on the bottom right, uh, this is a, a near uh, Assyrian representation of an Elamite town. So um, not too relevant for our uh, old Babylonian housing at Ur, but maybe significantly um, the domestic buildings of the town are represented as these, um, I hope you can see, these little detached houses. Um, which all clearly show doors, but all of which clearly also don't show any windows. Um, lastly, we have, again, a rather weak strand of evidence in the form of um, ethnographic analogy. Um, so uh, this, this example on the bottom left is the very well studied mud brick architecture of Jenne in Mali. Um, and this at least shows uh, that um, mud brick housing with no windows are perfectly livable and are a good adaptation to hot arid climates. So um, moving on uh, beyond these rather weak indicators for windowless houses, the strongest evidence for ancient Mesopotamian houses having no window light um, comes from the excavated house plans themselves. So in uh, Delegaz's uh, publications on um, Tel Asmar, he actually notes that many of the rooms of the domestic houses have no external walls, um, either to the outside of the house uh, or into a courtyard um, through which you could put uh, windows to provide light. Um, so in this example, I've um, coloured three of these uh, rooms of this house plan in red. Um, and if you look at the adjacent architecture, they're completely buried um, with no external walls at all, um, either to the courtyard or um, outside of the house. Um, but like many before and since, um, Delegas uh, hypothesised uh, clear story windows. So it's windows um, just below the uh, roof line, so above the surrounding architecture, but below the roof line, um, in order to solve this uh, apparent conundrum. However, um, if we reject the assumption that windows were necessary in these buried rooms um, that don't have external walls, uh, we are forced to embrace a different hypothesis, and that is that houses were lit entirely through doorways. This hypothesis, um, unlike hypothetical windows, can be tested uh, against the archaeological data because um, doorways are preserved at ground level, um, obviously, and uh, we have many complete examples of Bronze Age Mesopotamian house plans with their doorways intact. So, um, can we use house plans to show whether or not they were designed to be lit through doorways? Um, much more critical to the, um, I'm sorry. Okay. 
So in order to assess this, um, I came up with a rather simplistic method for showing how much um, doorway light each space in the house would receive. Um, unroofed spaces, um, the courtyards are shown in white. Uh, rooms with two external doorways are yellow. Uh, rooms with one external doorway are orange. Uh, rooms with a doorway through to a room which has an external doorway are red. Um, and a room separated by two other rooms from an external doorway are purple. Um, so here are a couple of uh, quite simple house plans from Old Babylonian Nippur to, um, to demonstrate this. Uh, as you can see, almost all of the rooms have access to at least one external doorway, uh, which would have meant that they were pretty well lit when the doors were open. Um, the entrance vestibules have uh, two external doorways, um, so they're coloured yellow, uh, one doorway from the street and um, one doorway from the courtyard, uh, which is a very common feature for these spaces in most of the houses analysed. Uh, these simple house plans um, with one rank of rooms surrounding a courtyard are fine for showing that there were um, enough external doorways to adequately light the rooms, but it's not exactly a smoking gun for the absence of windows. Um, <clears throat> a second source of evidence. Um, much more critical to the argument are house examples uh, where the simple courtyard house form is varied. So in these two examples, uh, a second rank of rooms has been added to one side of the courtyard. Um, in all the examples uh, with this situation I could find for domestic houses where a second rank of, uh, rank of room has been added, um, it's always added on the side that has the exterior entrance. Um, so you can see this here in these two examples. Um, in this house on the left from early dynastic Tel Asma, um, there's even a second exterior street door, um, which uh, ensures that this, um, that one of these two ranks of rooms can be lit properly from the street, while the other is lit from the courtyard behind. Um, more than one street door is quite rare in Mesopotamian domestic houses. Um, except in this case where double ranks of rooms um, isolated from the light of, courtyard, uh, light of um, the courtyard have been added. If clerestory lighting um, was an option, uh, we could add a second rank of rooms to any side of this house um, and just use windows below the roof line to light them, but this doesn't seem to be the case. You have to put um, the second rank of rooms between the exterior of the house, um, letting onto the street and um, the courtyard so that you can light from both sides using doorways. Um, so here are two more examples from Tel Asma. Um, on the left we can see uh, that the double depth of rooms again occurs between the street entrance and the courtyard, um, allowing doorway light from both sides. Uh, in fact again an extra street door has been added uh, to allow enough doorway light into these um, rooms which are isolated from the courtyard. Again if small high windows were an option the second street door um, would not be necessary um, and a double depth of rooms um, could have been added on any side of this courtyard instead of having to go between the courtyard and the exterior of the house. Um, the second example here on um, the right is what the excavator is considered to be a composite house. Um, this is a house which has annexed part of a neighbouring house, so it wasn't designed this way, it's um, sort of absorbed part of another building. Um, so although the doorway lighting uh, distribution shows that some of these additional rooms are now extremely poorly lit in terms of doorway light access, um, an effort to alleviate this does seem to have been made um, via the addition of this second street door um, um, at the uh, right hand um, corner of the building um, in order to try and address this problem. Again, if the problem could be addressed with windows, you wouldn't need to add a second door here. Um, and if, though it's not a very successful um, adaptation at this point, it does show that additional doors were necessary, probably to provide additional light. Um, what is actually the, probably the most telling example, however, is this very rare um, house plan um, from early dynastic Kafaja. And the really unusual thing about this house plan is that it doesn't have a central courtyard. Um, now, the response to this. Uh, unusual lack of a courtyard seems to be the provision of an astonishing five exterior street doors, um, which is a situation which I can't find replicated in any other ancient Mesopotamian house. Um, so uh, you might be able to easily spot um, four, but actually there's a fifth street door um, at the right at the top of the screen on a more conjectural um, bit of wall 
um, creating a, an extra room eight, which has, as far as the excavators could tell from the poorly preserved remains, another street door. So we have potentially five street doors for one house. Um, and as we can see, these five doors provide just enough uh, doorway lighting to light the interior of the house. So every room has some access to, um, to doorway lighting. But the necessity of using this uh, huge superfluity of entrance doors from the street um, in order to compensate for the lack of doorway lighting from the courtyard is the clearest, clearest demonstration that I've found um, that light could not be provided by windows, but rather that light had to be admitted through exterior doorways. Um, and if your only exterior was the outside of the house, you had to have lots of exterior doorways. So. Um, now that I've established, I hope, a fairly good case uh, for dismissing window lighting as any meaningful component of um, domestic architecture during this time, uh, we can at last turn our attention to the domestic housing at Ur. Um, in this case, concentrating on area AH of the old Babylonian housing. Um, unlike all the other examples I've used so far, uh, the houses at um, Ur have domestic chapels. Uh, which are generally considered to have played um, a role in ritual practices which were directed at household ancestors, um, who uh, many of which were um, buried beneath these chapel floors. Um, I've marked the chapel rooms with a C on these house plans, so the, the green circle with a C on. Woolley, uh, when he interpreted these rooms, um, was not sure if they were roofed or not. Uh, in two chapels, he found what he thought might be traces of a porch roof over just one end of them. Um, suggesting the rest of the room was open to the sky. Uh, in general, chapel rooms have usually been interpreted as roofed space, though, um, due partially to their rectangular shape, but also to some other factors, um, such as their lack of brains. Um, but um, the doorway lighting uh, position of these rooms within the architectural plans do tell a kind of interesting story. Um, as these three examples show, the chapel rooms, um, when we model them as roofed spaces, uh, are quite isolated from courtyard light. Um, usually uh, the main living room um, of the house uh, inter um, intervenes between the courtyard and the chapel room, meaning that the chapel is cut off from direct um, courtyard lighting. Um, so this could be connected uh, to the known requirement for temple cellar um, to be in total darkness. Uh, however, there are a couple of counter arguments here. Um, firstly, unlike uh, a temple sanctuary, uh, domestic chapels um, don't seem to have housed a divine image. Uh, they seem to have just been um, used as places of offering, um, judging by the textual sources. Uh, secondly, um, there are a number of texts, particularly the House Omen series, uh, which suggest that domestic houses should avoid um, incorporating any features which mimic temples. Um, so the, the presence of domestic scale temple sanctuaries um, in their darkness and isolation um, kind of seem less likely um, we're under this evidence. Finally, uh, if light isolation in the, um, is the architectural goal of domestic chapels, they aren't really positioned in the house plans to achieve this to the best, um, the greatest extent. Uh, in most house plans from area AH, uh, there are rooms beyond the chapel room, uh, which are even more isolated from doorway light. Um, but which don't seem to have uh, had a cultic function. Um, so uh, on these three examples, we have these two um, purple shaded rooms um, on the uh, one boundary lane and seven church lane, um, which are actually more light isolated than uh, the domestic chapel um, room. Uh, so if we go on to a couple of um, more examples, um, Domestic chapel rooms are actually often surrounded by a whole suite of other rooms um, which have no access to either courtyard light or street door light. Um, having so many rooms without adequate doorway lighting is pretty anomalous compared to houses from other sites, um, the other sites that I've covered. Uh, however, um, this is actually resolved if the chapel room is modelled as being unroofed. So here I've got two examples with side by side comparison. Um, of the doorway light distribution with the chapel roofed and um, with the chapel unroofed um, for these two examples of one Baker Square and one Broad Street. Um, in both cases, the chapel room is positioned really well to act as a second um, courtyard and provide doorway lighting to the suite of rooms that are around it. 
Um, so as you can see, with the chapel room roofed, you have um, quite a lot of purple and um, red shaded space, um, indicating very low lighting over quite a lot of the house. Um, whereas uh, once you unroof the chapel, um, the doorway lighting distribution is much more normal, um, being mostly oranges uh, with direct um, doorway access. Uh, so an area in each of these houses which is otherwise of unusually low lighting is transformed into a very normal looking doorway light distribution um, compared to the domestic housing at other sites uh, if we model these chapel rooms as unroofed. Um, so here's a further example from the large house um, at 4 Paternoster Row. Um, with the chapel roofed, um, shown here on the left, uh, almost half of the house's living space suffers from very low light access. Um, however, with the chapel unroofed, um, shown here on the right, uh, this is resolved and um, this half of the house becomes livable, usable space. The argument for chapel rooms acting as uh, second courtyards, in essence, um, makes sense in several ways. Uh, so chapel rooms were usually the largest room of the house, um, not counting the main courtyard. Um, and as we can see here, often had several rooms leading off of it. Um, it seems unlikely that such a large part of these houses, um, close to half of the space, uh, was used only for cultic purposes um, when space in, densely built, in the densely built um, urban landscape of Ur was clearly at a, at a premium. Um, it seems certain that chapel rooms and their surrounding rooms um, had to be multi multifunctional spaces, so outside of their use as a ritual setting, they had to fulfil the basic architectural functions of domestic space. And this includes the admission, admission of um, light and air into the space. Um, so the architectural argument for these spaces being substantially unroofed is very strong for the proper functioning of the building as, as domestic space. Um, a further inter interesting feature of this particular example at 4 Paternoster Row um, is the position of the main uh, living room, um, which uh, you can see on as the large room on the um, the right hand side, right hand diagram, which is coloured uh, yellow. Um, uh, so usually it would sit on the long side of the courtyard, uh, between the courtyard and the chapel room, as in the previous examples. Uh, however, in this case, it's positioned sort of awkwardly, um, with only a short section on the side of the courtyard um, and oriented uh, the in the opposite direction to how it usually would. Um, but it, ha it does maintain what seems to be an important feature of the main living room, and that is um, external doorway access to both the courtyard and to the chapel room. So two sources of um, exterior lighting through the doorways. Um, so when I model the chapel room as unroofed, this leads to the main living room having uh, unusually good doorway lighting with two exterior doors, um, hence the yellow shading. Um, with chapel rooms uh, modelled as unroofed, uh, this feature is really common to almost all main living rooms of Ur. Um, so here are some uh, here are three examples. So the, um, the living room is marked uh, with the yellow circle with an L, um, and the chapels are still marked with a C. Um, so in the case of 15 Church um, Lane, which is the bottom example here, uh, the living room actually has three external doors. Um, so this gives these living rooms equivalent lighting to entrance vestibules, which are usually the only other room um, with lighting from two doorways. Um, and this lighting would seem to correspond to the more public role of both of these spaces. So the entrance vestibule uh, where visitors might be received um, and the um, main living room of the house where more formal occasions might be held and again visitors might be received. Um, so the fact that the unroofed chapel rooms also serve to single out these main living rooms uh, of the house with a distinct lighting environment um, compared to the rest of the house, possibly particularly well fitting it to its more slightly more public functions. Um, it serves to add just a little bit more weight to the idea that the chapel rooms um, best serve an architectural role in the built space of these houses when they are unroofed. Um, so, what do unroofed domestic chapels at Ur potentially tell us about the nature of domestic cult, um, particularly the ancestor cult with which they seem to be most associated? Well, um, unroofed chapel, um, an unroofed chapel uh, would suggest that the rituals performed in the space were of a much more public and accessible nature within, within the household members, not, from not for people from outside the household, but within the household members. 
um, rather than how they're sometimes represented as a kind of um, slightly secretive or exclusive um, right of the head of the household uh, who controlled the space. Um, so rituals would have been clearly visible to everybody within the chapel space um, if it was unroofed uh, and could even have been observed potentially from the surrounding rooftops. Um, and this sits well with their apparent role um, and the apparent role of these ancestor um, uh, rituals in reinforcing um, family identity and household cohesion. So you'd want the maximum participation of the household. Um, unroofed chapel rooms uh, also complement the nature of some of the uh, um, Kispin rituals as they're described in texts. Um, so some of them are supposed to coincide with um, the rising of the sun or, or with the setting of the moon. And obviously um, these celestial phenomena are um, uh, obviously more observable uh, and apparent from an unroofed space than if this was an enclosed roofed space. Um, so yeah, uh, it, this uh, does lead on to some interesting uh, conclusions about the nature of um, domestic culture. Uh, um, there are also several other issues that it brings up, which I'd love to talk about, but uh, I think my time is pretty much up. Um, so um, thanks very much for listening. And I'm sorry again that I couldn't give this talk in person um, and be there to answer questions. Um, but do feel free to contact me with any queries you have uh, about the talk. Um, so I hope it's been interesting and I hope um, that it shows uh, some of the more creative things we can do with architecture um, in archaeology. So um, uh, thank you very much again. And um, I'm looking forward to catching up with the symposium uh, recordings um, when I, I get through my teaching week. Um, thanks. Bye.